Hey there, chemistry team. It's your chemistry coach coming at you with video number two for our chapter on complex ions and coordination compounds for your textbook. That is chapter 24. All right. This is going to be something you've never seen before. I mean, we did nomenclature last semester and first semester general chemistry. And we learned how to name the different types of acids and type 1 and type 2 ionic compounds and all that fun, you know, covalent compounds. Yeah, this, this has some parallels, but mostly not. <laughs> all right, the only thing that really follows with that is if we have a coordination compound, right? Remember, a coordination compound contains a complex ion. Now, that complex ion could be the cation. Could be the anion. You could have both. Oh, now those get real crazy. The naming rules are a little different if they're cations versus anions. So we're going to go through the details later. I just want to give you an overview here. All right. So if we got a coordination compound, name the cation first and the anion second, just like we learned in first semester. But we're not going to have your friendly neighborhood sodium ion and chloride ion, are we? I mean, we might have one or the other, but we know one or both of these is going to be a complex ion. <laughs> it's, just, it's kind of fun. All right. So regardless if one or both are, here's some basic rules. We are going, when we're naming a complex ion, we always do the ligands first, and then the central metal ion second. And again, it usually is a metal ion, but it could be have an oxidation number of zero and be neutral. But most of the time, it's going to be uh, uh, an ion. All right, here we go. When we name the ligands, so we're going to have to do on the next board, how do we name ligands? Because we're going to be altering the name. So chloride is no longer to be chloride, right? Nitrite is no longer to be nitrate. Even water is not going to be water. Ammonia won't be ammonia. The, all, the, all the names, if they're acting as a ligand, and in case the Lewis base, gets altered a little bit. So these are pretty distinctive. When you see these, you go, ah, that's a complex ion. We'll find out there's a lot of things ending in, oh, nitrito and chloro and fluoro and oh, all these weird things. I've seen two different ways to do this. A lot of times you just have one type of ligand, but more often than not, you're going to have two, three, maybe four different types of ligands attached to that central metal ion. We're going to list those in alphabetical order. All right. I've, I've seen other textbooks that do them in order of complexity, um, but I'm just going to keep it with what we have in our general chemistry notes uh, to keep it consistent. I'm doing this based out of our general chemistry notes, less uh, out of the textbook. So stick with the general chemistry notes. Um, so we're going to take all the and identify all like we did in the last uh, uh, video, identify all the ligands attached to that central metal ion, figuring out their names, which we'll do in the next board, and list them in alphabetical order. I'm going to do the same thing when I write the formula, right? When I write the chemical formula of a complex ion, I'm going to list the ligands in alphabetical order. Yeah, it's not the end of the world, but it makes it easier to name them, right? The order that you put the, the ligands in in the chemical formula is a critical, but I'm going to try to keep it consistent as best I can with being in alphabetical order. We're going to find out when we name uh, ligands, um, we have to designate how many, you know, do we have one, two, three, four, six of those different types of ligands. We're going to designate the number of each type of ligand with a prefix, right? So you might see a tri or a, you know, a, a penta or something, and so, or a tetrakis or something. There's some real re weird rules. We're not going to include those prefixes, right? So if I have, you know, two waters, that would be a diaqua. We would treat that as an A, aqua, not D for di. So diaqua would be aqua. So don't include that prefix in the alphabetical order. We'll see that when we do it. When we name the central metal ion, there's some complexities to that. It's going to be similar to how we did type 2 metals uh, in ionic compounds, like iron 3 or something, right? If it's a type 2, it has variable charges. So you have to designate that charge using Roman numerals in parentheses in the name. Iron 3 nitrate versus iron 2 nitrate, right? You don't have to do that with sodium because it only has one possible charge. So we're going to name the central metal ion second. We're going to include its oxidation number, just like we would... Uh, a type 2 uh, ionic compound. And we're going to do that in Roman numerals in parentheses, even if it's a zero, which is rare. So let's break down the details. Let's do ligands first, go through the different types of ligands, how to name them, and let's look at the different scenarios because we're going to find that we name the central metal ion differently if that central metal ion is part of a complex ion that's a cation versus a complex ion that is a 
Anna, Kenai and Anna. We actually name them differently. Oh, how hard can they make it? And then we have to use the Latin roots. Oh, my goodness. Okay, there's a lot of complex machinery here in naming coordination compounds. So we'll start with the ligand, right? Or ligand. Um, again, we name these first in alphabetical order, and we designate the number of each one with a prefix. We'll have to do the prefixes in a little bit. Let's do the names of the ligands and how we alter them, okay? <clears throat> So again, if the ligand is an anion, okay, exceedingly rare to see a ligand as a cation, we'll see quite a few that are neutral. So we're going to name neutral ones different than we do anions. You're going to see this anion trend. Same thing with the metal ions changes it. We're going to end it with an O. We're going to get a lot of O's here for ligands. So any anion with the I-D-E suffix, we just change that to O. So Chloride becomes chloro, fluoride, fluoro, bromide, bromo, iodide, iodo, hydroxide, hydroxo. Oh, you see the pattern there. All right, that's pretty simple to do. So the IDE becomes O. There are some exceptions to that. The hydride ion and the sulfide and the nitride, right? So because otherwise it would be hydro which is weird. That sounds like water. So they make it hydrido uh, to, to avoid the confusion. Sulfide, you'd think it would be sulfo, which just sounds weird. But in organic chemistry, you're going to see thio a lot, which represents sulfur. So they're going to use that uh, root there for sulfur as thio quite a bit. And then instead of nitro, which you'd think it'd be nitro, the nitride ion is nitrido because it's going to avoid confusion because there's an actual other term for nitro here. That, that would create quite a bit of confusion. All right, so that's for the IDE suffix. Um, and, you know, if you look at the, the polyatomic ions, they end in ite or eight, okay? So ite becomes ito. Eight becomes ato. So, for example, the nitrite polyatomic ion, NO2 minus, there's actually two different ways it can attach. You can attach at an oxygen with a lone pair, or add a nitrogen with a lone pair. Depends how it attacks it. If it attaches at the oxygen, we'll take the nitrite and make it nitrito. If it attaches at the nitrogen, that's an exception. We can't call it nitrito. That's already taken. We'll call that nitro. Thus, why we call this nitrido. Hey, see the feels it. So, and the ato, so thiocyanate becomes thiocyanato. Domo origato, Mr. Thiocyanato, right? Oxalate, oxalato, you get the feel for how this uh, plays out. Um, so let's do neutral ligands, and then we'll talk about uh, how we designate the number of them with prefixes. Okay, for neutral ligands, we don't have a suffix, right, like ite or ate or i to change into something with an o on it. So neutral ligands are a little bit different. I like it. You just leave the name alone, <laughs> all right? That's it. So methylamine would be methylamine, dimethylamine would be dimethylamine, ethylamine would be ethylamine. You get the point there? I didn't write a whole bunch of them. With some very, very common exceptions. You have to know these exceptions because you'll see water all the time. So instead of water or water -o or something weird, we call it aqua. Hey, like, oh, I should have worn my Aquaman shirt. Ooh, good. I'll get that next time. Ammonia, instead of ammonia or ammonio or something, we call it, um, oh, not amino. <laughs> amine, right? Instead of amine, we call it amine. All right, so that's pretty simple. Uh, NO, nitrosyl, and CO, carbonyl. So these you don't see as often, but you definitely see the ammonia and the water or the aqua and the amine quite often, all right? So let's do another board with prefixes, and then we can get into the um, metal ion, and then we can actually start naming complex ions and then uh, coordination compounds. We're just building up. All right, it's going to get a little weird here with the prefixes, guys, because sometimes they can cause some great confusion. So I'm going to break ligands up into simple ligands and complex ligands. The simple ones are simple, <laughs> all right? So your, your bromo, hydroxo, thio, right? Cyano, all those things. You know, they're not polydentate. They don't have these fancy names. We're just gonna use standard Greek, Greek prefixes. You know, di for two, tri for three, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, that kind of stuff, right? 
we are going to omit mono. So if you only have one, right, if I only had one bromo in there, I wouldn't go mono bromo. I would just say bromo, obviously with the assumption if it has no prefix, that would be mono, right? It would be one of them. So just omit the mono. But anything else, you got to tell me. Complex ligands is where the issue comes from. So there's three kind of different categories that fall into it. But we're going to use a different set of prefixes to avoid confusion. So instead of di for two, we're going to use bis, B-I-S. Instead of tri for three, we're going to use tris, T-R-I-S. Instead of four, tetra for four, we're going to use tetra kiss. Not with the two S's, not like the rock band kiss. My first concert ever, long. So anyway, Gene Simmons, I do the Gene Simmons thing. I can't quite do it. He like snipped his tongue, but Gene Simmons, great guy. Great, great uh, autobiography, by the way. All right, so what con what constitutes a complex ligand? Anything that's polydentate, all right? Unless uh, So the oxalate and the ethylene diamine, those are the two that I talked about specifically. So you're automatically going to give those, you know, the, the bis, the, the tris, the tetrakis. Um, and we're going to put the name of the ligand in parentheses, right? Because it gets pretty cuckoo. Um, so it kind of encapsulates it and clarifies things a little bit. So anything that's polydentate, we're going to co constitute as complex ligand. Anything that already has one of those prefix in his name, ethylene diamine. So you wouldn't go, if you had two of them, you wouldn't go diethylene diamine. Blah, it's getting redundant here. So we would, we would go bis parentheses ethylene diamine. See that? So even though ethylene diamine is um, bidentate, so it qualifies in both these categories, anything you see with a prefix already written in the name of the ligand, you can't use these Greek prefixes. You'd have to use bis, tris, and tetricus and put the ligand name in parentheses. Or anything that might cause confusion. All right, so take a look at this one. Methylamine, right? CH3NH2. If I said, if I had two of them, and I went dimethylamine, that can mean two things. Does that mean I have two methylamines, right? Two individual monodentate methylamines attached, or does that mean I have one dimethylamine, right? Because there is a dimethylamine as a ligand. There's a methylamine as a ligand. So if I go dimethylamine, I don't know if you mean one dimethylamine or two methylamines. Oh, you see where that causes confusion? So in that case, use the bis. Like you could go bis, you know, dimethylamine in parentheses. That would mean I had two of those. If I have two methylamines, I go bis methylamine, then you're not going to confuse it between those two. See the problem? All right, let's get into the metal ions, my friends. Okay, here's for the central metal ion. We got ligands done. Now we'll do central metal ions. Just put them together. Ligands first, central metal ions second. Here we go. Regardless of what type of complex ion it's in, we're going to designate the oxidation number of that metal in Roman numerals in parentheses, okay? So it could be a one, know your Roman numerals, right? Up to, you know, probably seven at the highest, I would imagine. Um, pretty straightforward. Even if it's a zero, right? You'd put the zero in parentheses. Now, we're going to change how we name metal uh, the metals if it's in a cation, neutral complex, or anion complex, right? So that's your three choices. It's got a negative something charge, positive something charge, or it's neutral overall. If it's a cation, it's got a positive charge overall, whether it's a plus two, plus three, plus one, or it's overall neutral, because you know, the ligands, if they have charges, it can cancel out, like two chloride ions would cancel out a positive two charge on like a copper ion. You could get a neutral complex. It's more common than you think. I love these ones. Don't change the name at all, right? So we could have copper, the copper two, tin four. I need a walkie-talkie there. Tin four. Uh, iron three, right? You do not alter the name of the original metal. And then you just add the Roman numerals in parentheses. But let's take these exact same metals, but put them in a complex anion with a negative charge. Negative one, negative two, negative three. <laughs> it all, the whole game changes now. If it's in a complex anion, we're going to use the suffix A-T-E and tack that on to the metal's name or the root if it has a Latin root. No! All right? So copper 2 in a complex cation would be cuprate 2, right? If it was in an anion. Tin 4 in a complex cation would be stannate 
Thus, tin has the SM symbol, <laughs> right? Stanate 4. Iron 3 would be ferrate 3. Thus, the FE symbol, right? So, plum, like lead 2 would be plumate 2. Get the feel, right? Gold 1 would be orate 1. You can see those. Now, if they don't have a Latin root, then you don't have to worry about it, right? So, it's pretty straightforward. You just do the name and just add the 8 suffix to it. So, it's pretty straightforward. All right. Let's put this all together, my friends. We'll do a couple examples. We'll be done, and then you can do your homework. Yay. All right, so if you need to review how to determine the oxidation number of the central metal, you need to review video number one on the introduction to complex ions because we need to put that oxidation number in the name. So we'll do maybe three or four examples. I'll leave some space so we can work it out. Now, you don't have to do the work I'm going to show you. If you can just do it in your head, just bleh, puke out the name. Blah, 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 blah. But they're crazy. They're kind of fun once you get it. All right, here we go. Let's look at, let's break this down like we did on the other video. Here's my central metal. I've got two of the ammonias or amine ligands. Everybody agree? That's a neutral one that has that special name amine with the two M's. Let's take a look at this one here. We've got two and the chloride is chloro, chloro ligands. That's what I'm breaking it down, and those are negative. Let's look at the oxidation number of the platinum, right? So we've got platinum, we've got one platinum, we don't know what it is. We've got neutral ammonia, so there's two of those, and those are zero, right? Those are neutral. And we've got two of the chloros, and that's going to equal zero. This is a neutral complex, do you see that? The overall charge of that is neutral. So we're going to name that uh, in the category of uh, the cations and neutral complexes where we don't have to alter the name of the central metal. We don't need Latin roots. We don't need eight suffixes. We don't change. So it's just going to be platinum, whatever the oxidation number is. I don't know the oxidation number. If you can see it's a plus two in there, more power to you. Skip all of this garbage. Here we go. So that's zero. Let's move the two over. So X equals positive two. You do not ever need to show me that work if you can do that in your head. So I need to designate that platinum as a plus two. I need to designate two of the amine ligands and two of the chloro ligands. Very structural, very procedural. A lot of chemistry is like that. Once you get the procedure, it's not too bad. All right, here we go. You ready? Now, we got to do this in alphabetical order without the prefixes. So A from the amine comes before C for the chloro. Right? And these are both simple ligands, so I'm going to use a diamine and a dichloro. But we don't use the di in the alphabetical order. So this, we'll do that first. This would be diamine. And let's do the two chlorines, dichloro, no spaces. This is a neutral complex, so we just write platinum. Ooh, I'm going to erase my uh, oxidation number stuff. This would be platinum, two, correct? And it's not even an ion. If that had a charge, I would put ion on the end. We're not even doing compounds yet. We're just doing the ion. That would be diamine dichloroplatinum two. Diamine dichloroplatinum with a plus two charge. Whaboom! Let's do the next one. Pause the video and you do the next one. All right. Let me break this up. So here we've got two of the waters, which would be aqua. Right? Water is a neutral ligand, so it has that special name, aqua. This is your, that's thiocyanate. So eight becomes uh, eto, ato, thiocyanato <laughs> with a minus one charge. So there's a four times the thio cyanato. This is an an, drop my pen. That's an anion, right? So that's an anion complex, which means we're not going to do chromium. We're going to do chromate. Now that doesn't have a Latin root, so we don't have to worry about it. So it'd be chromate, whatever its uh, oxidation number is in parentheses. Now, if you can't see the oxidation number, i.e. charge, 
of the chromium, we work it out like we did before. You ready? So we have one chromium. Let's call that X. We don't know its oxidation number. We got two waters, so let's add the two waters in there. Water's neutral, so that would be two times zero. We got four of the thiocyanates, which is a minus one charge. So four times minus one equals the overall charge of the species. Yes, that plus those plus those equals minus one. All right, so if that's zero, move the four over. Is that correct? So we add positive four, so that becomes a positive three. Is that by by that's usually where I screw up the basic algebra stuff, right? Get all the hard stuff and then I go four minus one is four. Oh no, I screwed up. No. You move the four over and there's a minus one on that side, so it gives it a positive three. So the chromium's a positive three oxidation number in there. Again, if you can do that in your head, oh yeah, you're doing better than I can. All right. Let's name this puppy. You ready? A comes before T. Even though we're going to have prefixes for these, A comes before T. You don't include the prefixes in there. So the prefix for two is di. The prefix for four is tetra. These are both simple complexes. We'll do some uh, more of the complicated complex, uh, complicated ligands in the next one where we got to use like the weird, the tetra kiss, things like that. So if we do the name for this, this would be di aqua, two waters, right? Uh, four is tetra thiocyanato. These are really long. Let me erase my oxidation number thing here. <laughs> Holy moly. You ready? Di aqua tetra thiocyanato. This is an anion, so instead of chromium, I'm going to go chromate, right? If it was in a, a positive one, it'd be just chromium. So chromate three, and that has a charge, so I'm going to put an ion on the end. Oh, take that one home and show your mama. <laughs> let's do some crazier ones. One more board, and let's do two more. Uh, and let's have some fun with these. I actually love this stuff. It's so logical. Ready to go for a wild roller coaster ride here? Two more examples. Give it a shot if you want to, right? Pause this and attack it. But in this next one, the third example, we're going to go from a name to a formula. Remember, we got to switch it up. Got to go both ways as a chemist, right? Formula to name, name to formula. And then I put up one that you guys made if you were in my class. Remember those cool crystalline green um, solids we made, that's the formula. A lot of you got that. We determined the empirical formula. We measured the percent mass of water, percent mass of oxalate, uh, percent mass of iron. We were able to do the empirical formula for that. That's what you were supposed to get. See if you can name that from your lab, those beautiful, gorgeous green crystals we made. All right, let's take the name. I find it easier to go from a name to a formula myself. Uh, breaks it down. Let's take a look at the pieces here. You ready? So here I got two bromos, right? Bromide is bromo. So I got two of those bromo ligands or two bromides. This means, uh, this is for a simple complex. That means it's one of those complex ones. And ethylene diamine is a bidentate one, right? So bis means two. No, no, yeah, two. So bis, tris, and tetrakis, two, three, and four. That means two times the ethylene diamine, so that's the NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2, or a lot of people just go EN because that's a pain, <laughs> right? Rather than writing that thing out, we just write EN for ethylene diamine. Um, gold, right? So it's not orate, so that means since it's gold, it must be a, either a cation or a neutral complex. That's gold three. And then we've got the phosphate anion here. So it looks like we've got a cation complex ion with phosphate as the anion for this one. So this is a, a coordination compound. We have both a, a complex cation and a regular polyatomic anion with phosphate. All right, so let's write this complex ion down here. Let me do it in black. 
Um, I'm going to do the bromine first, then the ethylene diamine. Got two of these, two of these. Gold's a plus one, so I'm going to do the gold. I've got two of the bromines, bromos. I'm going to do the EN in parentheses. You could write the whole thing out, NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2, if you want to. You can write EN. We put in that parentheses because it's complex. This whole thing is going to have, let's see, these are neutral. These are minus one. I've got two of them. That's a plus three. So three minus two would give me a plus one charge. These are neutral. Those are negative one. That's a positive three. So that is the complex cation. And that's my anion. So now my coronation compound will be this with this, and that's a plus one. Phosphate's a minus three, so I need three of those complex cations to cancel that out. So let's do this. You ready? Let's write my complex cation. I need three of those to cancel the phosphate. See how that works out? That is a coordination compound with a complex cation and the phosphate. Hey, not too bad. Let's do that green crystal you did in your lab. Let's break this puppy up. All right, so I've got three potassium ions. Right, that's my cation. This is also a coordination compound. It's also a hydrate. We're going to get a trihydrate on the end to make it even worse. Let's break this down. This is Fe C2O43. If there's three potassiums, that must have a minus three charge. Right, it has to. So we've got three oxalates, and that's a bidentate ligand. So that's going to have, and there's three of them, so it's going to be the tris oxalato. But that is a minus three charge. That's why we have the three potassiums for electrical balance. All righty, moving along. Uh, so three of these, so we have three times the C2O4 2 minus oxalato ligand. Right, oxalate becomes oxalato. We should be able to do this pretty readily, right? We name the cation first, so it's potassium. Let's see, what's the charge on my iron? What's the oxidation number? Can you see it? If I have three of the minus two oxalates, that's a total of minus six, correct? And so the, the, the ligand is a minus six total, and the overall complex is a minus three, so that means the iron must be a plus three. 3 minus 6 is minus 3. So we have an iron 3. I'm not going to go through and do the algebra for you. But if you don't see why that's a positive 3, go ahead and do the algebra like we've done in all the other ones and prove to yourself that iron is a plus 3. Now this is a complex anion, so we got to use the Latin root and the 8. That's going to be ferrate 3. So potassium... Let's do the tris. So this would be potassium. Tris, right, because it's a bidentate ligand. Put the oxalato in parentheses. That's tris oxalato. This is going to be, because it's an anion, ferrate three. So potassium, tris oxalato, ferrate three. <gasps> Normally, that would be enough. I'm not going to do the hydrates on your test, but we're going to put a tri hydrate. Oh, ho, ho, ho. that's what you spend weeks and weeks on in your lab. Oh, my gosh. Potassium trisoxalato ferrate three trihydrate. Oh, oh, man. Just call the ambulance on that one. That's nomenclature, guys. Practice it. It gets easier and easier the more you do it. Get Make a flashcard of the different ligands and their names. That will help you tremendously, trust me. All right. So we've done in video one, intro to complex ions and coordination compounds. Video two, how to name these puppies. Video three, let's look at some of the reactions they can undergo. You guys are awesome.